Hi, Wasteland TV. We are here with Richard Moore. What does Richard Moore do? Richard Moore uh, writes and illustrates comics. Which comics have you illustrated? Ah, I've done a bunch. Uh, I'm probably best known for Boneyard. Uh, I also did Fire and Brimstone and uh, Far West. Those are probably the ones I'm best what known for. What do we have for? to do Total West? I used to read that series. Uh, like the first four issues, and it kind of disappeared. Uh, well, I did a four issue miniseries and then a two issue follow up miniseries. Has there been anything after that since? Uh, there hasn't yet. I have a Patreon page right now, and I'm going to be doing some Far West shorts on there. So, what uh, what about Boneyard? Is that ever going to reappear again? Boneyard is probably the main thing I'm doing on, on the Patreon page. I'm doing uh, shorts. Uh, they're all connected. And uh, then I'll be segueing into a longer story down the road. So are you doing self-publishing now? Instead of being part well, of another company? When I get enough, uh, say, a Boneyard uh, for a collection, uh, that will probably be through a publisher. Uh, other titles I'm not sure I, I, I might do myself. So which is, do you have any personal titles you're working on right now? Personal uh, project titles? You know, they're, they're all personal projects. I own my own property, so they're all, all personal. So you don't work with any of the mainstream uh, companies that you used to? Well, I've kind of lost contact with some of them. And obviously, if you're working online, you don't, you don't need a publisher until you're down the road. And I will probably seek out a larger publisher than I've dealt with in the past to, just to get wider distribution. Which ones? Uh, it's always been my dream. I know everybody dreams of working for Marvel and DC. I've always wanted to work with Dark Horse. Uh, they just the kind of books they they put up really speak to me more than anybody else's. Not any of Images titles because they've been doing a lot of Dark Horse based like stuff. Image has a very unique uh, mode of business. What they do is they take X amount off the top of the profits, and you get what's less, what's left. Well, that's great if you sell out. But if you don't sell a lot, you could wind up doing an entire book and getting $100 for it. And that's happened. So unless you're a big name, it's, it's kind of risky to do that kind of business That's why they've been, uh, and they only promote big names in, their com in the other comics. Yeah. Yeah. There's really no surprise hits out or smaller titles. Yeah, um, and it's a shame because you expect smaller companies to, to let uh, smaller titles become bigger you know, with time. Like Dark Horse in the, in the golden age of when they had all the uh, creative owned titles, they had a lot of them. Exactly, Dark Horse. I mean, uh, look at Max Mignola. I mean, his stuff, he started doing, you know, shorts on Dark Horse Presents. And uh, there's not really, a, that, that kind of thing doesn't really exist anymore. No. Also, the, the after the golden age of uh, black and whites, it also didn't help much. Yeah, uh, especially with everyone going online, and it's so easy for most people to do their own digital coloring. I'm something of a dinosaur. I don't use computer programs. So I, I get used to people coming up at the table, and they open it up, and they see it's black and white, and they, they close it again. Uh, so that's definitely something I need to pursue in, in, in the future. So do you feel it's wrong that the black and white is being pushed out by color? Uh, I don't think it's right or wrong. I think it's it's still there for the you know the, the small independents. Um, a lot of people kind of cling to black and white because it gives them an indie status. Uh, I think it depends on the title. Uh, some stories work well in black and white, and others scream out for color. I, th I think it, it depends on, on the piece. Like let's say the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Do you think it screamed out with co for color? I'm sorry, which one? The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. That's uh, the biggest of the black and whites. Yeah, I, I think if they certainly, if they had had the capability at the time, they, they would have done color. Um, because it was, uh, well, there were two waves. There was the way it started out, which was very indie, and then they, it kind of morphed into a more commercial quality. I think certainly for the commercial, commercial version, they would have wanted color. Yeah, I know they went uh, color with IDW with the current run. Yeah. And uh, Kevin Eastman's back writing it and drawing part of it. Yeah. I think it just it broadens your audience because. Only some people are going to want to read a black and white comic, but everyone's willing to read color. So it just, it just widens your audience. Do you think it's because people haven't promoted black and white like they used to? Um, or color just stands, just makes you see it and the colors are... It's just... It, play on know, the we, see, we see life in color. I, I think we relate to it better. Um, and it's just, it's just so much more dramatic. You, you can establish a mood with color in a way that you can't with black and white. 
So, who does the coloring for your covers then? You do it? Uh, a few of the later ones were colored by like Antarctic Press, colored uh, Iron Brimstone, uh, but uh, the other ones are all just hand painted. So, um, with Antarctic Press, how did you feel about working with them? Because uh, they're still around. They're still around. I don't know how much I should get into here. Um, there have been some shakeups at AP, I'm sure you've heard. I haven't heard. Uh, well, look into it. <laughs> some, some legal problems that they had. Uh, they had a, a contract to put out a book that they were, some would say, were harassed into uh, not publishing. And since then, I, I haven't been able to really get a response from them. I don't know what's... Is Ben Dunn still a part of the company? I'm not sure. Um, I've been getting cryptic responses, um, so I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, I think there's been a shakeup, and I haven't been privy to what's going on inside. Yeah, because I know you don't see it on uh, comic book shelves and stuff anymore. Yeah. You know, usually, uh, at our press, is always even a bottom shelf comic and even a small mom and pop store. Yeah. Now you don't even see it anymore. Yeah. Well, they were. I don't know what their publishing situation is. Maybe that's why I haven't heard back. Uh, they were already a small company to begin with, and then suddenly having this legal problem. And a lot of people in the field didn't like the way they went about handling it, so it may have had a backlash, which is really unfortunate, because they're a small company, they do their best, and did not deserve to get dragged into something like that. Yeah, because the mom and pop, uh, I will say, because that is like the mom and pop of comic book production. Yeah. They were to, they, they gave people hope that they could do their own thing. Exactly, and they, just, they don't have the kind of pockets you need to deal with some, with some serious legal problems. To the juggernauts, Marvel, yeah. Disney, exactly. DC, Warner. Yeah, yeah those yeah. kind of people can just, just throw lawyers at you all day long. Yeah, and you can lose a license and you don't even realize it. Exactly. And people hear about trouble like that and they shy away. Which is, so it's, it's really unfair. You think that's why a lot of people are going YouTube, uh, internet uh, production, publication? I think a lot of people are doing that because, because it's so easy. Uh, it eliminates the gatekeepers. You, know, you don't have to uh, please anyone else. You don't have to put together the same kind of body of work. You can just put it out there. Uh, that means you have a lot of stuff out there that's not very good. But hopefully you also have stuff out there that wouldn't have seen print before and gets a chance to develop and flourish. Because we did, that. but then too, in the black and white 80s era, there was a lot of stuff that was crap. Yeah. And there's a lot of beautiful stuff that was there out there, and there was a lot of beautiful stuff that had bad stories attached to it. Yeah, if there's, but I find that in any kind of artistic endeavor, uh, I always tell people I'm a horror fan, but I hate most horror. Most of anything is crap. To, if you look real hard, you'll find 10% that's really good, and that's worth finding. Yeah. It's really hard to find that 10%, because I know I like sci-fi. Like sci yeah. But I also enjoy the bad sci-fi, too. There's certain elements of that bad sci-fi that make you laugh. Yeah. Well, because there, well there's, that, there's that deadly middle ground where it's bad, but it's not bad enough to be funny. And then there's the bad enough to be funny. And it, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Troma was good for that, so was uh, Corman. Mm -hmm. They were both real good for having these movies that you seem like, they sell them as really these A-list films, and then you watch it and go, this is really, really... Yeah. And, and unlike things like Sharknado that are made to be bad, that just kind of falls flat to me. Yeah, because they're, 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 they're talking to a different audience, an audience that doesn't know yeah. or explore what really bad movies are. Yeah, yeah. and there's something endearing about someone putting all that, like an Ed Wood, putting 100% effort it, into it and not realizing that it's garbage. You know, yes. it's kind of endearing. He did the best he could. He wasn't good at it, but he still tried. You know? Yeah. <laughs> this is the rest of the crew, Sonic and her brother. But we'll finish this off here. I think they want to go to lunch. Okay. <laughs> so, thank you. Mm -hmm. I hope you enjoyed the interview. Yeah, it was great.